This program is brought to you by Emory University. My name is Frank Alexander, and I'm delighted and honored to welcome all of you to this inaugural Don Browning Lecture on behalf of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion, Emory Law School, and Emory University. For those of you who are from outside of the Emory geographic community, a special welcome and congratulations on finding your way to the campus and a place to park. We're delighted to have you here at the law school. For those of you who are new to the law school and for those of you who are 1L law students, today is going to be an experience you will never forget. The Center for the Study of Law and Religion offers this lecture series every year, Where Law and Religion Meet. We've already had two of, uh, distinguished lectures. Our colleague, Professor Michael Broyd and Professor Mary Ann Glendon of Harvard Law School, both in the early fall. This is the third in this year's lecture series. Two weeks from today, we will have the fourth lecture by Luke Timothy Johnson, and then in March, our colleague, Professor Michael Perry. The Center for the Study of Law and Religion goes back roughly 30 years here at Emory. As part of this center, we offer six joint degree programs, 40 cross-listed courses throughout the university. We've graduated almost 100 joint degree students over the decades. We've had nine multi-million dollar major research projects crossing 20 fields of study, which have yielded over 300 books in the past 25 years. This lecture today is the inaugural lecture in honor of Don S. Browning. Don Browning was the Alexander Campbell Professor Emeritus of Religious Ethics and Social Ethics at the Chicago Divinity School. John and I were privileged to talk Don Browning into coming to Emory in 2001 as the first Robert W. Woodruff visiting professor in the Law and Religion program. With us, he co-directed a project on sex, marriage, and the family, Religions of the Book. He co-edited with John Whitty an entire book series on religion, marriage, and the family. We talked Don into becoming a senior advisor of another multi-year project on the child in law, religion, and society. We also talked Don into becoming a senior fellow and advisor of our Christian Jurisprudence Project, which spans six years. Now, Don may have thought when he was retiring from Chicago Divinity School and coming to spend some time with us that life would be more leisurely. He did not realize that John Whitty and I desperately needed his guidance and advice. Don Browning worked harder, I suspect, over the past 10 years having this affiliation with us than he ever did at Chicago. We needed him, we loved him, we treasured him. Don Browning was in many ways an older brother to my colleague John Whitty and to me. He gave us pastoral advice, theoretical advice, he encouraged us. He directed us and guided us when we were in the, going the wrong way. In the 10 years that Don Browning was part of our program, he did nine books himself. He finished his last book entitled Public Order, Private Order to Public Covenant, Christian Marriage and Modern Marriage Law, just two weeks before his death in June of 2010. By creating this lecture series in honor of Don Browning, it is a token tribute to the tremendous gifts he has given to all of us, to John and to me, to our students, to our colleagues, to the profession of law, to the interdisciplinary work in law and religion. We are especially honored today that Carol Browning, Don's wife, and his son, Christopher Browning, have traveled here from Illinois and Ohio to be with us today. Please join me in thanking Carol and Christopher for coming and for everything. It 
It is a different kind of privilege and honor for me to introduce the person who's going to give this guest lecture today. When I was struggling in law school and in divinity school many years back, my mentor was a professor named Harold Berman. Harold Berman at that time had written a series of essays called The Interaction of Law and Religion, which were widely rejected by the legal academy, but widely absorbed and intensely read by a few of us eccentrics who thought that religion and law had something to say to each other. In the mid-1980s, when Emory University, under the leadership of President James T. Laney, decided to create a law and religion program, it reached out and persuaded Harold Berman to come to Emory. And how Harold Berman left that school at Harvard, came here to fulfill his career, and was a member of our faculty for over 20 years in the fields of law and religion. Hal Berman was the father of law and religion studies for the past 60 years, really. He was certainly my father in the studying of this work and John Witte's father in the study of this work. Hal Berman came here in 1985 and he brought with him this young student who had just graduated from Calvin College who Hal Berman said had potential. He brought John Witte here in 1986 as a young research assistant. Well, in the 25 years since then, John Witte has done what no one else at Emory Law School has done. John Witte has published over 26 books, over 200 articles in the past two decades, two and a half decades. I suggest as much as the rest of the entire law school faculty combined. John Witte speaks five languages. I struggle with one. John Witte writes more books in a single year than I will read all total in a year. <laughs> John Witte has been my brother, my little brother, lets me affectionately refer to him as Little John, but he has been the one who has made the Law and Religion program what it is. He is the one who brought Don Browning to Emory. Hal Berman would not have come without bringing John Witte. John Witte is the one who brought Martin Marty. John Witte is the one who, despite invitations to teach at any university in the country, and every university in the country, John Witte decides to hang out here with us. And I am so thankful for that. John Witte recently was named the to the McGuire Chair of the Library of Congress and to the Scholars Committee of the entire Library of Congress. We now share some of John's time with the Library of Congress with folks on the Hill. When he's not here, John is delivering lectures throughout the world. In any given year, he will deliver 50 to 75 lectures, whether in the Pacific Rim, in Europe, or throughout North America. To have him here is an incredible gift to us. He is an incredible gift to those of you who are in his classrooms. Now it's early in the spring semester, but I encourage you to realize that having John as your professor is a gift that you will always have. John Witte has been an incredible gift to me, and his presentation today, Sharia in the West, what place for religious family values in America, is going to be something that all of us will take forward in months and years to come. Please join me in welcoming my little brother, John. My goodness. Uh, thank you so much. I wish half of that about me were true, uh, but I'm delighted, delighted uh, to be here, and I'm especially delighted to hear about my late great friend, uh, Don Browning. A wonderful friend, a wonderful pastor, a wonderful colleague, a teacher. Uh, he was just a brilliant scholar. Um, we worked together for almost 20 years on the interdisciplinary study of marriage and family and sexuality. 
Uh, we had the chance to work with hundreds of scholars around the world on some of the fundamental questions that are dividing church, state, and society today. Um, Don was a consummate scholar. Don was a brilliant, brilliant tactician. Don ran conferences, he ran projects, he wrote books, uh, but he was an orchestrator uh, of the very, very best first order scholarship on marriage, family, sexuality in the world. Uh, a wonderful man, and for me a dear friend uh, whom we miss dearly today. Carol and Chris are here to represent the Browning family, and the Browning family is also represented in all the many readers of Don's books and the many colleagues that have sat at his feet uh, and participated with him in the deep conversations. I always called him the Dean of Interdisciplinary Family Studies, and we very, very much need our Dean today as we're dealing with these very hard questions. So it's a special honor at Emory to be able to continue the great conversations that Don so ably led for us to be part of a rich interdisciplinary and interreligious discussion about some of these fundamental matters of faith, freedom, and family that are gonna occupy us today uh, and to have a lectern that will permanently bear his name as a place for uh, discourse about the things that he held dear and which he led with such acuity all these years. So it's a special honor to have Carol and Chris with us, a special honor to have so many friends who are supportive of the Don Browning Lecture Series uh, and supportive of the kind of scholarship that Don uh, exemplified with such alacrity. I thought today I would just experiment with a few loose thoughts about a new topic that's right on the edge of the frontier of constitutional law, religious liberty, family law, and criminal law alike, and just speculate with you, map a few of the hard issues about the place of religious legal systems, in particular Muslim family law, in our emerging Western democracies and in our established Western democracies, especially in North America. I'll talk for about 40, 45 minutes. Hopefully we'll have a little time for questions, but I hope uh, many of you will avail yourself of conversations, casual and formal, uh, in the days ahead if we run out of time for real conversation. On February 7, 2008, Anglican Archbishop Rowan Williams set off an international firestorm by suggesting that some accommodation of Muslim family law was, quote, unavoidable in England. His suggestion, though carefully qualified, prompted more than 250 articles in the world press within a week, the vast majority denouncing the proposal and the archbishop. England, the archbishop's critics charged, will be beset by licensed polygamy and barbaric procedures and brutalized violence against women encased in suffocating burqas. Muslim citizens of a Western democracy will be subject to legally ghettoized Muslim courts immune from civil appeal or constitutional challenge. Consider Nigeria or Pakistan or other former English colonies that have sought to balance Muslim Sharia with the common law. The horrific excesses and chronic human rights violations of their religious courts even ordering their faithful to stone innocent rape victims for bringing dishonor to their family, prove that religious laws and state laws on the family simply cannot coexist. Case closed, the archbishop's critics concluded. This case won't stay closed for long. The Archbishop was not calling for the establishment of independent Muslim courts in England, let alone the enforcement of Sharia by English courts. He was instead raising a whole series of hard but unavoidable questions about marital, cultural, and religious identity and practice in modern Western democratic societies dedicated to human rights for all. What forms of marriage should citizens be able to choose and what forums of religious marriage law should states be required to respect? How should Jews and Christians and Muslims and other religious groups with distinctive family norms be accommodated in a society dedicated to religious liberty and self-determination, to religious equality and non-discrimination? Are legal pluralism, maybe even a form of personal federalism needed to protect Muslims and other religious believers who are conscientiously opposed to the liberal values that now inform sex, marriage, and family law in the West? 
These and many other hard questions are becoming unavoidable in many modern Western democracies with growing and diverse Muslim communities, each making new and ever louder demands for accommodation. If current growth rates of Muslim communities in the West continue, a generation from now, the so-called Danish cartoon crisis is going to seem like child's play. Even democratic countries that share a common law heritage and a common commitment to human rights and religious freedom have taken quite different approaches to these questions. Consider three examples, England, Canada, and the United States. England has the largest groups of Muslim minorities and they have been the most accommodating of Muslim schools and banks and charities and arbitration tribunals. And in particular, English courts are increasingly deferential to the arbitration awards issued by Muslim tribunals as long as they are truly voluntary and non-coercive. And the same deference is accorded to the marital arbitration awards of Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, and others as long as they're peaceable. Canada, though the most constitutionally liberal of all the, of these three countries, debated very seriously a decade ago whether there should be independent Sharia courts in Ontario and then in Quebec, but ultimately, after deep contest, rejected them in favor of a single provincial law for all of its citizens, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, when it came to marriage and family. But Canadian Muslims enjoy ample freedom of worship, education, charities, banking, religious rituals, apparel, and the religious groups have very little encumbrance upon their group corporate rights. The United States, though with sizable and diverse Muslim populations, have been the least accommodating of its Muslim citizens, especially the last 10 years. American Muslim litigants have not fared well of late when they have challenged state denials of charters or exemptions for their schools or charities or mosques, nor have they often succeeded in challenging prohibitions to wear traditional religious apparel from headscarves to burqas when teaching in public schools or testifying in state courts or serving in public functions. Most American state courts have only very sporadically upheld Muslim marriage contracts. They've often sided, and increasingly so, with non-Muslim spouses in divorce and child custody cases involving mixed marriages. And they've held a very firm line against Muslim polygamy and granted shrinking deference even to mediation settlements that are now before them from Muslim tribunals. But American Muslims have continued to agitate for greater religious freedom, autonomy, self-determination in these fundamental issues of marriage, family, and domestic life. It is no surprise that it's the law of marriage and family life that has triggered this new contest between law and religion in Western democracies. For marriage has long been regarded as both a legal and a spiritual institution subject at once to special state laws of contract and special religious canons and ceremonies. Marriage has also long been regarded as the most primal institution of Western society and culture. Aristotle and the Roman Stoics called the marital household the foundation of the Republic, the private font of public virtue. The church fathers and medieval Catholics called it the seedbed of the city, the force that welds society together. Early modern Protestants called the household a little church, a little seminary, a little commonwealth, the first school of love and justice, charity, and citizenship. John Locke and the Enlightenment philosophers called marriage the first society to be formed as men and women move from the state of nature to an organized society dedicated to the rule of law and the protection of their natural rights. Because of its culture and importance, Marriage was also one of the first institutions to be reformed during the decisive battles between church and state in the history of the West. In the fourth and fifth century when Constantine and his imperial successors converted the Roman Empire to Christianity, they gradually passed new marriage and family laws predicated on Christian teachings. In the 12th century, when Pope Gregory VII and his successors threw off their civil rulers and established the Catholic Church as the independent sovereign 
of Western Christendom. The church seized jurisdiction, lawmaking power over marriage, calling it a sacrament subject to the church's canon law and church courts. In the 16th century, when Martin Luther, Henry VIII, and other Protestants called for reforms of church, state, and society, one of their first acts was to reject the Catholic canon law of marriage and the sacramental theology that supported it and to transfer principal legal authority over marriage back to the Christian magistrate. In the 18th century, when the French revolutionaries unleashed their fury against traditional institutions, they took early and sharpest aim at the Catholic Church's complex marital rules and roles, ultimately consigning marriage to the secular authorities. And in the early 20th century, when the Bolsheviks completed their revolution in Russia, one of Lenin's first acts was to abolish the legal institution of marriage as a bourgeois impediment to the realization of true communism. Most Western democracies have not abolished marriage as a legal category, but they have dramatically privatized it and thinned out many of its traditional elements. A century or so ago, most Western states treated marriage as a public institution in which church, state, and society were all rather deeply invested. With ample variation across jurisdictions, most Western states still define marriage as a presumptively permanent monogamous heterosexual union with men and women had put freedom and capacity to marry each other. A typical state law required that engagements be formal, that contracts be publicized and parental consent and witnesses be summoned and a suitable waiting period of engagement follow. It required licenses and registration and then eventually solemnization. Couples who sought to divorce had to publicize their intentions to petition a court to show adequate cause and fault to make provision for the dependent spouse and children. Criminal laws outlawed fornication, adultery, sodomy, polygamy, contraception, abortion, and many other perceived sexual offenses. Tort laws held third parties liable for seduction, enticement, loss of consortium, alienation of the spouse's affections. Today, by contrast, a private contractual view of sex, marriage, and family has come to dominate the West with very little constructive role to play for parents or peers or religious or political authorities or the public at large. Marriage is now simply regarded as a private bilateral contract to be formed, maintained, and dissolved as the parties see fit. Divorce is now simply an expensive private formality, and the distinction between annulment and divorce is relatively minimal. Payments of alimony and other forms of postmarital support the dependent spouses and children are now giving way to privately negotiated and rubber stamp lump sum property exchanges to give the parties a break to start their private lives anew. The functional distinctions between the rights of the married and the unmarried, between the straight and the gay partnership have been considerably narrowed by a whole array of new statutes and constitutional cases. Virtually all the traditional sex crimes have become dead letters or been obliterated from the books with the only ones left still being incest and polygamy and even those are now being subject to sharp challenge. These exponential legal changes in the past half century and more have in part been efforts to bring greater equality and equity within marriage and society and to stamp out the patriarchy and paternalism and plain prudishness of the past. These legal changes are also in part simple reflections of the exponential changes that have occurred in our culture and condition of Western families. The stunning advances in reproductive technology, the exposure to vastly different perceptions of kinship and sexuality born of globalization, the explosion of international and domestic norms of human rights, the implosion of the traditional nuclear family born of new economic and professional demands on the household. But most fundamentally, these legal changes represent the rise of the new theory of private ordering of the domestic sphere and the growth of a new democracy of desire. A fantastic range of literature 
has emerged over the past 30 or 40 years, variously describing, defending, or decrying all of these legal changes. Many Muslims living in the West decry these massive changes to prevailing state laws of sex, marriage, and family, and they want out. Some Muslims have gone back to their majority Muslim homeland, shaking their heads in dismay at what Western libertinism has wrought. Others have stayed put and just quietly ignored the state's marriage and family law using the shelter of constitutional laws of privacy. Others have developed elaborate prenuptial contracts that seek to exempt Muslim couples and families from much of the state law in favor of their own internal norms. Still others have led bicultural lives, dividing their time between Western and Muslim majority lands that allow them to form Muslim marriages and families, including those that feature polygamy, patriarchy, primogeniture, and a few other things. All of these informal methods of cultural and legal coexistence, however, are only temporary expedients. These creaky accommodations and concessions can easily fall apart. Eventually, a Muslim citizen will appeal to the state for relief from a religious marriage contract or a religious family practice that he or she cannot abide, but also cannot really escape. Eventually, an imam or a shadow Sharia court, of which ample operate in the West, will overstep using force or issuing a fatwa that will draw the ire of the media or the scrutiny of the state. Eventually, an aggressive state caseworker or prosecutor will move upon a Muslim household, bringing charges of coerced or polygamous marriage. Eventually, a Muslim school or charity will find itself in court faced with a suit for gender discrimination or with child abuse owing to its practice of single-sex education and corporal punishment. And once such a major case or controversy breaks and the international media gets involved, many of these informal and temporary domestic arrangements might well unravel particularly given the cultural backlash over the last 10 years against Muslims prompted by 9-11, 7-7, Fort Hood, and the bloody unpopular and desperately costly wars against Islamicist extremism in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. It is precisely this vulnerability that advocates of faith-based family law and Sharia courts want to avert. They want to put Sharia family law and its voluntary use by Muslim faithful on firmer cultural and constitutional ground in the West. But rather than denouncing Western liberalism and the sexual, moral, and marital lassitude it has occasioned, sophisticated advocates now press their case for Sharia in and on the very terms of Western constitutionalism and political liberalism. Three main arguments dominate the literature, which is mounting. The first of these arguments from the case for Sharia is an argument from religious freedom. Both Western constitutional laws and international human rights norms give robust protection to the religious freedom of its citizens. Why should peaceable Muslim citizens, the argument goes, not be given religious freedom to opt out of state laws of sex, marriage, and family that run afoul of their core claims of conscience or central commandments of their faith? Why should they not have freedom to choose to exercise their domestic lives in accordance with the norms of their own home religious community? Why doesn't freedom of religion protect a sincere good faith Muslim with protection against a unilateral divorce action or a child custody order by a state court that runs directly counter to their internal religious laws? Why doesn't freedom of religious exercise empower a pious Muslim man to take four wives into his loving permanent care in imitation of the prophet, particularly when his secular counterpart can consort and cavort freely with four women at once and then walk out scot-free. The second argument 
for Sharia is an argument for religious equality and non-discrimination. After all, many Western Christians do have religious courts to govern their internal affairs, including some of the family matters of their faithful, and state courts will respect their judgments even if they are appealed to Rome or Canterbury or Moscow. No one is talking about abolishing these church courts or trimming their power even after recent discoveries of grave financial abuses and cover-ups of clerical sexual abuse of children in some of these churches. No one seems to think that these Christian tribunals are illegitimate when some of them discriminate baldly against women in decisions about ordination and church leadership. Similarly, Jews are given wide authority to operate their own Jewish law courts, to arbitrate marital, financial, and other disputes amongst the Orthodox Jewish faithful. Indeed, in New York State by statute and in many other states and European nations by custom, the courts will not issue a civil divorce to an Orthodox Jewish couple unless and until the Jewish law court, the Bet Din, issues a religious divorce even though Jewish law systematically discriminates against the wife's right to divorce. If Christians can have their canon laws and consistory courts, and if Jews can have their halakha and their bet din, and if even indigenous peoples can have their ancestral laws and tribal rulers, why can't Muslims be treated equally in the use of Sharia and Islamic courts? The third part of the case for Sharia is an argument from political liberalism. One of the most basic teachings of classical liberalism is that marriage is a, a pre-political, a pre-legal institution. It's not created by the state, it comes before the state and its positive laws, both in historical development and in ontological priority. As John Locke put it famously in his two treatises on government in 1689, the marital contract was the first contract, the first society to be formed as men and women came forth from the state of nature. The broader social contract came later, presupposing stable marriage contracts and contracts to form hmm, state governments or religious communities or other voluntary associations came later still. Why on this simple liberal contractarian logic should the state get exclusive jurisdiction, lawmaking power over marriage? After all, it was 16th century Protestants, not 18th century secular enlightenment philosophers who first vested the state with marital jurisdiction. But why is state jurisdiction over marriage mandatory or even necessary? Before the 16th century Protestant Reformation, and in many Catholic lands well after the Reformation too, Catholic canon law and Catholic church courts governed marriage, family, and sexuality norms of all sorts. Moreover, even in Protestant England, Parliament delegated to church courts until the 19th century the power to deal with marriage and family questions. There is evidently nothing inherent in the structure of Western marriage and family law that requires that it be administered exclusively by the state. And there's nothing ineluctable in liberalism's contractarian logic that requires marital couples to choose the state rather than their own families or their own religious communities to govern their domestic lives, particularly when those states' liberal laws diverge so widely from their own cardinal beliefs and practices. On this latter argument, conservative Muslims sometimes join hands with conservative Christians and selected critical liberals who call for exemption from or the abolition of state marriage law. Conservative Christians, because the state in their view has betrayed traditional Christian teachings on marriage. Critical liberals, because the state has allegedly continued to encroach on their individual liberty and sexual autonomy. So let's fuss with these three arguments a little and see how they come out. The problem with the first pro-Sharia argument from religious freedom is that it falsely assumes that claims of conscience and freedom of religious exercise must always trump 
Well, that's hardly the case in modern democracies, even though religious freedom is prized. Even the most sincere and zealous conscientious objector must pay their taxes, register their properties, answer their subpoenas, obey their court orders, and abide by many other general laws for the common good that they may not want to in conscience abide. Their eventual choice, if they persist in their claims of conscience, is to leave the country or to go to jail for contempt. Moreover, even the most devout religious believer has no claim to religious exemptions from criminal laws against activities like polygamy or child marriage or female genital mutilation or corporal discipline of wives, even if their particular brand of Sharia might command it or their particular religious or cultural community might commend it. The guarantee of religious freedom is not a license to engage in crime. Muslims who are conscientiously opposed to liberal Western laws of sex, marriage, and family are certainly free to ignore them. They can live chaste private lives in accordance with Sharia and not register their religious marriages or families with the state. And that choice will be protected by the Constitution. But that choice also leaves their family entirely without the protections, rights, and privileges available through the state's complex laws and regulations, not just about marriage and family, but of marital property, inheritance, social welfare, education rights, residual life insurance, social security, and so much more. And if minor children are involved, the state will intervene to ensure their protection, support, nurture, and education, and will hear nothing of a religious freedom objection from their parents or from their community leaders. Western Muslims enjoy the same religious freedom as everyone else, but some of the special accommodations pressed by some Muslim Sharia advocates today in the name of religious freedom are simply beyond the pale for most Western democracies. Even further beyond the pale is the notion of granting a religious group legal sovereignty over the sex, marriage, and family lives of their voluntary faithful. It's one thing to allow religious officials to officiate at weddings or testify in divorce cases or assist in the adoption of a child or facilitate the rescue of a distressed family member. Most Western democracies readily grant Muslims and every other religious community that's peaceable these kind of accommodations. A few democracies will also uphold mediation and arbitration awards over discreet domestic issues. But that's a long way from asking the state to delegate to a religious group the full legal power to govern the domestic affairs of their members in accordance with their own religious laws. No democratic state can readily accommodate a competing sovereign to govern such a vital area of life for its citizens especially since family law is so interwoven with so many other laws, and especially since so many rights and duties of citizens turn on their marital and family status. Surely, a democratic citizen's status, entitlements, and rights cannot turn on the judgments of a religious authority that has none of the due process, transparency, and other procedural constraints that attached to a state tribunal making these judgments. Moreover, the proud claims of Muslim advocates that Sharia provides a time-tested and comprehensive law governing all of sex, marriage, and family and these related fields is for many an even stronger strike against its accommodation. Once a state takes the first step down that slippery slope, skeptics argue, there will eventually be little to stop the gradual accretion of a rival religious law over sex, marriage, and family, particularly as Muslim communities grow largely, larger and more politically powerful. And some Western states thus resist even religious arbitration and mediation for Muslim tribunals. We just saw in Oklahoma a couple of years ago a constitutional amendment passed that said, no Sharia in this state, thank you. Twelve additional states have con are contemplating comparable measures. Six European nations are doing the same. Australia, New Zealand, and several other Commonwealth countries are pushing that same agenda. The pro-Sharia argument from liberal contractarian logic 
The argument that said since marital contracts are pre-political, coming before contracts that form the society, the state, and religious associations, marital parties should be free to choose whichever law they wish is a clever argument, but it's incomplete. It ignores another elementary teaching of classical liberalism, namely that only the state and no other social or private union can hold the coercive power of the sword. The government contract does give this coercive power of the sword over individuals to the state, but only in exchange for strict guarantees of due process, equal protection, and respect for fundamental rights. A comprehensive system of marriage and family law, let alone all the correlative legal systems of inheritance, trust, family property, children's rights, education, social welfare, and so much more, cannot long operate in this land without coercive power. It needs police and prosecutors and prisons, subpoenas, fines and contempt orders, material, physical, and if necessary, corporal sanctions. Moral suasion and example, communal approbation and censure can certainly do part of the work in an insular community. But in our porous and transient society, a properly functioning marriage and family law system requires resort to all of these coercive instruments of government and only the state not a religious body can exercise this coercion against its members. The pro-Sharia argument from religious equality and non-discrimination. Jews and Christians and others have their tribunals, we want ours too, it takes a lot more effort to resist. A useful starting point is the quip of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who said, the life of the law is not logic, but experience. Holmes's adage has bearing on this issue. The current accommodations made to the religious legal systems of Christians and Jews, First Peoples, and others in the West were not born overnight. They came only after centuries of sometimes hard and cruel experience with gradual adjustments and accommodations made on both sides. The accommodation of and by Jewish law to Western secular law is particularly instructive in this regard. It is discomforting, but essential to remember that Jews were the perennial pariahs of the West for nearly two millennia, consigned at best to second-class status and periodically subject to waves of brutality, whether imposed by Germanic purges, medieval pogroms, early modern massacres, or the 20th century Holocaust. Jews have been in a perennial diaspora for two millennia, living in a wide variety of legal cultures in the West and indeed well beyond. One important legal technique of survival that they developed after the third century of the Common Era was the concept of dina da mahuta dina. The law of the community around is our law. This meant that Jews accepted the secular law of the legitimate and peaceful secular ruler who hosted them as the law of their own Jewish community to the extent it did not conflict with core Jewish laws. This technique allowed Jewish communities to sort out which of their own religious laws were indispensable, which more discretionary, which secular laws and practices could be accommodated, which had to be resisted even at the cost of life and limb. And this technique led not only to ample innovation and diversity of Jewish law and culture over time and across cultures, it also gave the Jews the ability to survive and to grow legally even in the face of ample brutal persecution. Western democracies in turn, particularly in the aftermath of the Holocaust and in partial recompense for the horrors it visited on the Jews, have gradually come to accommodate core Jewish laws and practices. But it's only in the past two generations and only after endless litigation and lobbying in state courts and legislatures that Western Jews have finally gained legal ground to stand on. And that ground is still thin and still crumbles at the edges at times. 
Today, Western Jews generally have freedom to receive Sabbath day accommodations, kosher food, don distinctive dress, get charters and privileges for their synagogues and charities and schools and more. And Jewish law courts have been given the right to decide some of the domestic and financial affairs of their faithful who voluntarily elect to arbitrate their disputes before them rather than going to secular courts. These Jewish law courts are attractive to Jewish disputants because they're staffed by highly trained jurists. One of them is our distinguished colleague Michael Broyd, who are conversant both with Jewish law and secular law and sensitive to the bicultural issues that are being negotiated. Unlike their early medieval and modern early modern predecessors, these modern Jewish law courts claim no authority over all of Jewish domestic law, leaving a lot of issues to the state. And they've also abandoned their traditional authority to impose physical coercion or sanctions on their disputants. In particular, they claim no authority beyond persuasion to stop a disputant from simply walking out of the Jewish court and out of the Jewish community altogether. The modern lessons in this story for Sharia advocates are four. First, it takes time and patience for our secular legal system to adjust to the realities and needs of new religious groups and to make the necessary legal accommodations. The hard-won accommodations that modern Jewish law and culture now enjoy are not fungible commodities that Muslims or any others can simply scoop up with a simple argument from equality. These are individualized, equitable adjustments to general laws that each community needs to earn for itself based upon its own distinctive needs and experiences. Muslims simply have not had the same history of persecution that the Jews have faced in the West and simply do not yet have a long enough track record of litigation and lobbying. Concessions and accommodations will come, but only with time, with persistence, with patience. Second, it takes flexibility and innovation on the part of the religious community to win accommodations from secular laws and cultures. Not every religious belief can be claimed as central. Not every religious practice can be worth dying for. Over time and of necessity, diaspora Jewish communities learned to distinguish between what was core and what penumbral, what essential and what more discretionary to Jewish legal identity and practice. And over time, and only grudgingly, Western democracies learned to accommodate the core religious beliefs and practices of Jewish communities. Diaspora Muslim communities in the West need to do the same. Islamic laws have changed dramatically over time and across cultures, and modern day Islam now features immense, sophisticated varieties of the laws available to their faithful. That diversity provides ample opportunity and incentive for Muslim diaspora communities in the West to make the necessary adjustments to Western life and to sort out what is core and what is more discretionary in their religious lives. Cultural adaptation, not cultural assimilation, is what is needed to win accommodations of the state. Third, religious and com communities in turn have to accommodate or at least tolerate the core values of the secular host nations if they expect to win concessions for their religious courts or their religious practices. No Western nation will long accommodate, perhaps not even tolerate, a religious community that openly denounces its core values of liberty, equality, and fraternity, or human rights, democracy, and rule of law. Those who wish to enjoy the freedom and benefits of Western society have to accept its core cultural and constitutional values as well. So far, only a small and brave band of mostly Western-trained Muslim intellectuals and jurists most preeminently our distinguished colleague, Professor Abdullahi An-Naim, 
have called for the full embrace of democracy and human rights in and on Muslim terms. These are highly promising arguments courageously and brilliantly proffered. But so far, these arguments can hardly be heard amidst all the loud denunciations of them from sundry traditional Muslims in and beyond the West. Moreover, even liberal Muslim intellectuals are hard pressed to point to modern examples of a Sharia-based legal system that maintains core democratic and human rights values. Unless and until that case can be reliably made out, deep suspicion will remain the norm. Western-based Muslims have an ideal opportunity to show that Sharia and democracy and human rights can coexist together in the West. Let me pass over the fourth point because time is fleeting. Lest all this seem like an unduly patronizing, pat on the head argument for religious minorities, you just wait and see. You make some changes and hope for the best. It's worth remembering that majority Christians today too went through much of this same exercise in the area of religion and education. The American story offers a good illustration of how this developed and how common educational standards were eventually raised and maintained in the process. In the 19th and early 20th century, a number of states wanted a monopoly on education as taught in public, that is, in state schools. A good bit of this agitation was driven by anti-religious and especially anti-Catholic animus. Catholics in the mid-19th century were the pariahs of North America, pilloried in the press, criticized in legislatures and courts, their monks, their nuns, their priests killed, their churches desecrated, their cemeteries destroyed. They were hated. Sounds familiar. For half a century and more, Catholic and other religious churches, schools, and parents struggled earnestly to try to protect their rights to educate their children in their own private religious schools. And in the landmark case of Pierce versus Society of Sisters, the US Supreme Court finally held for the churches and the religious parents and ordered American states to maintain parallel public and private education options for their citizens. But in a long series of cases thereafter, courts also made clear that states could and should set basic educational requirements for all accredited schools. Mandatory courses and subjects and texts, minimal standards for teachers and students, common requirements for labs and gyms and facilities. Religious schools could add to these states' minimum requirements, but they could not subtract from them. Religious schools that sought religious liberty exemptions from these requirements found little sympathy from these courts, which instructed the schools either to meet the standards or lose their accreditation. Catholic and other schools gradually fell in line, and now Catholic education from kindergarten to the end of graduate school is one of the envies of the nation. This compromise on religion and education forged painfully over nearly a century of legal wrangling has some bearing on these questions of religion and marriage. Marriage, like education, is not a state monopoly, even if marriage law must be a state prerogative. Religious parties in the West have long had the right to marry in a religious sanctuary following their religious communities' wedding liturgies. Religious officials have long had the right to participate in annulments and divorces and custody battles of their voluntary members. But the state has also long set the threshold requirements of what marriage is and who may or may not participate. Religious officials may add to these threshold state law requirements on marriage, but not subtract from them. A minister may insist on premarital counseling before a church wedding, even if the state will marry a couple without it. But if a minister bullies a minor to marry out of religious duty, he's going to jail. 
A rabbi may encourage a bickering couple to repent and reconcile, but he cannot stand in the way of one of them filing for divorce. An imam may preach of the beauties of polygamy, but if he knowingly presides over a polygamous union, he's an accessory to crime. If religious tribunals do get more actively involved in marriage and family questions, states may well build on these precedents, both in education and so far in marriage, and set threshold requirements in the form of a license, formulating these license rules through a democratic process in which all parties of every faith and non-faith and anti-faith participate. Amongst the most important licensing accreditation rules to consider for these religious tribunals, no child or polygamous marriages or other forms of marital union not recognized by the state, no compelled marriages or coerced, coerced, coerced conversions before weddings that violate elementary freedoms of contract and conscience, no threats or violations of life and limb or provocations of the same, no blatant discrimination against women or children, no violations of basic rules of procedural fairness and more. Religious tribunals may add to these requirements but not subtract from them. Those who fail will lose their licenses, their accreditation to be tribunals, and will find very little sympathy when they raise religious liberty objections. This type of arrangement worked well to resolve some of the nation's hardest questions of religion and education, and it led many Catholic and other religious schools slowly to transform themselves from backward sectarian isolationists into exemplary cultural leaders, which they are today, see the Supreme Court. Muslims in the West have already begun to do some of this exercise too in the development of Muslim grade schools and high schools, which are now becoming ever more attractive, especially in the inner city, to non-Muslims because of their rigor, their discipline, their capacity to teach basic subjects. Such an arrangement holds comparable promise for questions of religion and marriage in Western Muslim communities. It not only provides a safeguard against the descent to licensed polygamy and barbaric procedures and brutalized violence that the Archbishop Williams' critics have feared, it also encourages today's Sharia tribunals to reform themselves and to reform the marital laws that they offer and in the process of adjusting to the legal and cultural realities of their new homes in the West, Muslim religious minorities may eventually become the legal and cultural leaders of marriage, family, and sexuality norms in succeeding generations of the West. Thank you so much for your kind patience. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.